When you study the Bible, you'll discover that right from creation, humans were intentionally created by God for Himself and His pleasure. This means that you did not originate under some mud or come from Mars, like some people may say. The Bible tells us that each one of us was created, either male or female, in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I love how someone put this in one of the videos I came across one time. They said, When God created every other thing, He spoke to something for them to appear. For example, He spoke to the earth, and plants and trees came forth. He spoke to the water, and aquatic creatures were formed. However, when it came to man, the Bible says God spoke to Himself as the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it records that He made man after His image and likeness. Hence, everything is made a creature connected to a source, which in turn becomes their natural habit, and without which they would not survive. God is man's natural habitat, and that is why the Bible tells us that we are like dead beings without God, as long as we walk in our own ways. I love this because it helps us see how much we need God in our lives, even more than we know. You see, after creating man in his image, God breathed his own life into him. If you read further in Genesis, you will see that man was God's fellowship partner. He frequently visited Adam and was the source of Adam's empowerment. You will see that empowerment when Adam named all the animals God brought to him, knowing their names, without God telling him what they were supposed to be called. He also demonstrated that, even though he was in a deep sleep when Eve was created, when he woke up and saw her, he could tell she had come from him and even called her woman for the first time. However, when they both fell from glory and lost their place in Eden, humanity was plunged into a life without God's presence and became subject to the dominion and control of the devil. But through the death and redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the Bible tells us that we are restored to openness with God, and the Spirit of God can now live in us again. You see, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is the demonstration of the multifaceted nature of God that is able to step down and live in our natural bodies without completely consuming us. I believe all these things demonstrate the love of God for His most prized possession, mankind, you and me. You see, if you read through the Bible, you will see how ordinary people became extraordinary when the presence of God came upon them. They became literal carriers of God. Everywhere they went, people could tell there was something extraordinary about them. The patriarchs of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, demonstrated this. Even in the midst of famine, they thrived. When Pharaoh and Abimelech tried to take Sarah away from Abraham, God took it personally and came for them. When Laban went after Jacob to try to hurt him, God warned him in the night to be careful what he said to him. When Joseph's own brothers sold him into slavery out of jealousy over his dreams of greatness, the Bible tells us that because God was with him, he enjoyed favor even as a slave and a prisoner. I could continue, but I'm sure you get the point. I hope to use the message in this video to encourage you to seek after God's presence until you become a carrier too. Please. Understand from that the moment you become a child of God, His Spirit comes to live inside of you. However, even though the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you need to receive more of His presence so there is an overflow to those around you so that you can be considered a carrier. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that we have the Spirit of God as a guarantee of our inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14 says, And you also were included in Christ, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, 
the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. This happens at the new birth, but there is another outpouring that creates an overflow of the same Spirit that is beyond just us, making our lives notable to others. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost when the disciples gathered in the upper room and the Spirit descended as a mighty rushing wind. When He rested on them, the Bible says that they began to speak in other tongues, giving glory to God. The same timid Peter who denied Jesus a few days before stood before a crowd of thousands and boldly proclaimed the gospel, leading 4,000 to Christ. That, my friend, is evidence of the overflowing Spirit of God in you. Then, as recorded in Acts, the Bible tells us that they gathered to pray again. The place shook. They were filled with the Spirit again, and they began to speak in other tongues, preaching the gospel with boldness despite being threatened by the religious leaders. These are evident signs that you have become a carrier of God's presence. Nothing can stop you because you are overwhelmed by someone greater than what is before you. Do you remember 1 John chapter 4, verse 4? You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Let me list some signs that will accompany you when you carry the Spirit of God's presence overflowing in your life. Number one, when you carry the Spirit of God's presence in your life, you will discover a deeper sense of confidence in God that produces boldness in the face of frightening or uncertain situations. This was evident in the lives of people like Abraham, David, Joseph, Moses, and the disciples. In fact, at one time, when people saw the boldness and wisdom of the disciples, knowing that they were ordinary people, they knew that this was the handiwork of Jesus. They concluded that they had spent time with Jesus. The Bible even tells us that when the Spirit lives in us, He will quicken our natural bodies supernaturally. My friend, you need to ask for grace to spend more time with the Lord until people can tell that what they see in you is not natural. The many distractions in the world may feel exciting, but they are robbing you of the wonder-filled life of being God's vessel to the world. And the price is straightforward. Spend more and more time with Jesus. Number two, when you carry God's presence, you will see certain supernatural manifestations in your life. The Bible calls these manifestations of God the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of God is actually the overflowing of God's presence with someone touching the lives of those around him or her. Did you notice how someone touched Jesus' clothing and received healing without Jesus even laying hands on her? Did you also notice how Peter's shadow healed people when he walked past them on the street? How about handkerchiefs taken from Paul's body healing people? David's slingshot killing the giant Goliath in one strike. Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream easily, or Daniel being able to tell King Nebuchadnezzar his dream and its interpretation without being told any details. All of these are not human works. They are the results of people who became vessels for the Spirit of God. When you stood before them, they were ordinary men like you. However, what made them great was that, wherever they went, they carried God. And in God's presence, everything is possible. I pray that these words are stirring up a hunger in your heart for more of God's presence in your life. Honestly, our world today needs more than just words of identification with Christ. We need to start feeling God in our lives. But we cannot give what we do not even have, can we? Number three, when you carry God's presence, people will feel more comfortable to share their personal issues with you and will testify that they feel safer talking with you. When I was younger, I once heard people say this about men and women of faith whom I admired. So I began to seek this effect too until I heard people say it about me. I didn't practice anything. It was just the outflowing of God in me. This is what happened with the woman at the well and Jesus. She probably wouldn't tell strangers about herself so easily, but she did with the Savior. Why? There was something soothing, loving, and peaceful about Him. If you ever hear this, know that it's not you, but the presence of God that you carry. Number four, Joseph is proof that when you carry God's presence, 
you will see favor. The Bible says that when a person's ways please God, he would make even the person's enemies to live peacefully with him. Joseph was a slave, yet he was promoted to chief steward over his master's home. When he was wrongfully accused by the master's wife and imprisoned, he found favor before the prison keeper and his fellow prisoners. This favor would go on to speak for him before Pharaoh, giving him the opportunity to use his gifts to interpret the king's dream and save thousands of lives. People are bound to help you when you carry God's presence. Number five, another sign of God's presence in your life is that you are sensitive to sin and uncomfortable when you see any sin in your life or around you. Anyone who enjoys the presence of sin or enjoys the practice of sin is one who lacks the presence of God. No matter how attractive sin is, you will find that you are continually restless. Even when you sin, you will not find peace until you seek mercy and repent. This is a sign that you carry God's presence. Final point on these signs is that your heart will always swell with compassion for others, especially the unbeliever or the helpless. You will find yourself less judgmental and more truthful and always think of how to contribute to their transformation. It will always break your heart to see people on their way to hell and away from Jesus. Now the Word of God clearly draws the picture of how to nurture and accommodate more of the Spirit of God's presence in our lives. Give yourself time in prayer and fasting. Give yourself to studying and meditating on the Word. Share your faith with others. When you do these things, you are opening yourself up to the Spirit of God's presence as a channel for Him to touch the world around you. These are not things you do once or twice and expect to see manifestations. They must become your lifestyle. You must ask that God help you to love Him and seek Him genuinely until you become a worthy vessel for His use. Don't ask Him to make you His vessel because you want to have power. That is a selfish desire and God will not honor it. However, with a pure heart after God, the more you open yourself to God's presence, you will realize that demonstrating to others is just one benefit of God's presence with you. The main benefit is that you are constantly enjoying fellowship with Him where He protects you, teaches you, strengthens you in your time of weakness, and comforts you in moments of pain. What would you do if, in following God, you found yourself face to face with the Red Sea and a ruthless enemy closing in behind you? Would you agree to be one of the singers whom King Josephet chose to be in the vanguard in a war against three allied nations. The story of how God showed up for his people in these events is proof that if you let him fight your battles, no matter how powerful your enemies are, you won't lose. This is a message for you, the child of God. Do you want to experience victory over your unfavorable circumstances? Then you must let God fight your battles. You have tried enough by your own power you have worked by your strength. Your natural mind has brought you to its limit. It's time to introduce the supernatural help of God on your behalf. It's understandable for a people who have been subjected to slavery for over 400 years to lose heart when they found themselves stuck between the Red Sea and the charging slave masters riding towards them to enslave and destroy them. They were men, women, and children. There was no rich or poor among them at this time. This wasn't the time to ask about social statuses or to display any mental prowess. Everyone was stuck in the same hopeless situation. They couldn't move forward without the risk of drowning, which would defeat the whole purpose of leaving Egypt. But they couldn't turn back either, because their former slave masters were riding towards them in a battle formation that spelt the one thing, death. They had probably given up, then God's word came to them through the mouth of his servant Moses. Exodus 14, 13 through 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. God was telling them two things, and I am bringing those two things before you now. Those two things saved the Israelites before the Red Sea and the Egyptians, and they are still potent enough to save you today. 
Number one, God said, fear not. Fear is a killer. It kills faith. It kills your ability to see possibilities. And if you cannot see or hear, then you will struggle to believe. For faith to come alive, it sees something based on what God says. A woman believes she would carry her own baby even though she was told that she could never do so. Why? Because God said she would, and she saw that possibility. This was not because she had never had a child of her own, but because she believed what God said, and that became a picture she held on to. It kept her going until she had the child just like God promised. Contrary to this, fear keeps you from accepting what God says, what is true, by overwhelming you with the impossible so much that you are unable to see any picture other than the one of impossibility. That is why fear is always followed close behind by doubt. Years ago, I read that there are about 365 places in the Bible where the words fear not are used. This may also be God's way of telling us that for every day of the years of our lives, we must make sure we do not embrace or walk in fear. 1 John 4, 17 through 18. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. Fear is crippling, but love empowers us over it. When you are rooted in the understanding of God's love for you, you will boldly face any battle in your life head on. Do you know why? You are convinced that you're not alone. Someone has got your back and he will fight for you. Isaiah 43, 4, God says, Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. God has got you, my friend. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Cancel the fear. Cancel that fear of the unknown, that fear of death that plagues you, that fear of failure, that fear that it will never work. Instead, turn to the love of God. Take refuge in the awareness that God has got you covered and that he will give you the things he placed in your heart. He has not brought you this far to turn his back on you. He didn't make you survive everything that happened just to cut you short here. No, if he brought you this far, he will see you through to the end. Tell yourself, I refuse to fear. God loves me and he is always with me. I love him and I choose to stand with him. Reject fear. It's not from God. It's a weapon of the devil. If you allow it into your life, it will cripple you and keep you from all that awaits you in God. The second thing God told the people and which he is always telling you today is stand firm. It can be difficult to stand firm for long, especially when it seems you're standing on the wrong side, when it seems like things are working everywhere else but where you are, and it feels like you are deluding yourself and have become the laughing stock of those around you. It can be difficult and the pressure to move becomes very great. However, there is only one place God wants you to stand. It's in faith in His Word, trusting in His ability to bring it to pass. That something works for another person apart from God doesn't make it safe for you. That everyone is doing it doesn't mean you should. That it looks harmless doesn't mean it is. Satan has been taking over the lives of many through apparently harmless decisions for ages, and he is still doing so today. Do not fall for his tricks. Stand firm in faith. Stand firm in your convictions. How do you let God fight for you? How do you let him take over your battles? Fear not and stand firm. These two aren't things you fall into or wake up with. No, they're things you take responsibility for and intentionally gain. 
It's a spiritual position, a battle formation, where you and God become a team and your battles become His own. Think about this. What is the common thing that happens when life hits people hard? Over time, they fall into despair and lose faith in their convictions. You might even hear them say something like, I don't even know what to believe anymore. This is a sign that their convictions are shaken. This is a sign that they aren't standing firm anymore. But the Bible tells us what happens to those who stand firm until the end. Matthew 24, 13. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Although in this context, Jesus was talking about the great troubles that will engulf the world in the last days, in which believers will face enormous spiritual opposition. Those who stand firm in their faith will be delivered. However, we can also apply this to our context today. Anyone who stands firm without wavering in their convictions in God's ability will be saved. Your fight is not a physical fight, so you don't need physical weapons to do battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. The weapon we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So when you face that difficult boss, that impossible situation where you're at risk of losing everything, that false allegation, or that troublesome family member, remember that you're in a fight against spiritual forces. Hence, you must use spiritual weapons for your fight. How do you spiritually take up your position for battle? Throw out fear and choose to stand firm in faith. This will be demonstrated by how you talk, how you pray, and how you act. It means you will keep praying about the situation even when it seems like nothing is happening. It means you will keep speaking God's promises even when it seems like they're moving too slowly. It means that you will keep doing what is good according to God and staying true to your beliefs even when you're not being appreciated for it. Take that issue to God in prayer. Prayer has the power to change things, my friend. I have seen prayer change people change government policies, and turn hopeless situations around. I once heard a preacher say, if there is a man to pray, then there is a God to answer. What God needs is for you to talk to him about it, and then watch him take it up himself. Why was it so important that I laid the foundation of faith and standing firm before mentioning prayer? Because I know that many believers don't have a problem with prayer. They have a problem with standing firm. But you see, that is where the real issue is. Sometimes we pray about difficulties in our lives and the next we interfere with God's handling of them and then blame Him for being slow. Standing firm in faith means that you deliver your battle to God and then you stand still and watch Him deal with it while you follow Him. As God fights for you, He will tell you where to go, what to do, what not to do, what to say and what not to say, when to speak and when to say nothing. You see, you give the Lord liberty to operate on your behalf by obeying these instructions, which are your weapons of warfare. No man is at peace as the man who knows that God fights his battles. I encourage you to emulate Moses and the Israelites between the Red Sea and the Egyptians today. I encourage you to emulate King Jehoshaphat today. Hand over your battles to God and hold your peace. Stand firm on your faith and watch God deal with the situations in your life for you. As you do this, like Moses, I declare that the Egyptians, the troubles you see today, you will see them no longer. Let me tell you something about the Holy Spirit that you probably haven't been told before. Make sure your heart is open to this truth as God will use this video to illuminate your heart about this wonderful aspect of His being that resides within you. I will also share some signs that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, even though you don't know He is the one. Many children of God have different opinions about the Spirit of God. Some schools of thought say that He is the breath of God. 
So, when they feel a wind, it is the Holy Spirit flowing in and around you. Some say that the Holy Spirit is God's hand of judgment, among other things. But when you look at the Word of God carefully, you will see that all of the schools of thought seem to have shared different bits and pieces of the entire person. You see, the Holy Spirit is God's breath. He is not God's demonstrated power, and He is God, the third part of the Trinity, which comprises the Father, Son, and Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son, and is of the same essence, yet He is also distinct from them. The Bible describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms, not as an impersonal force, when it says that He teaches, guides, comforts, and intercedes. He also possesses emotions, intellect, and will. But when He, the Spirit of Truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all of God's truth, not some, but all. He would also reveal things yet to come, things not known by the natural mind to us. In John 14, 16 and 17, Jesus added, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, and take to its heart, because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him, because He, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually, and will be in you. Here, He is saying that the Holy Spirit would be our advocate, helper, intermediary, and comforter. The scriptures also attest to the deity of the Holy Spirit by showing the qualities of omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, and eternality. He does works only God can do such as creating, regenerating, and sanctifying. The Holy Spirit played such a major role in your salvation. When you received the gospel and turned to Jesus Christ, it is the Holy Spirit who brought conviction to you as an unbeliever and caused you to see the truth of the gospel in a clear light. Anyone who responds to his conviction and places their faith in Jesus Christ receives eternal life and a new nature. The Holy Spirit unites the believer with Christ and places them in the body of Christ, the family of God on earth and in heaven, the church. The Holy Spirit also unites you, the child of God, with Christ in His death, enabling you to live victoriously over sin. When these conditions are met, you will live in and witness His power to produce more and more fruit in your life. Lastly, the Holy Spirit lives in you permanently. As the Bible says that He is the seal of your salvation, His absence would mean that you are not saved. This means that He is the guarantee of your salvation until the day of redemption. When you sin and grieve the Spirit, He will still never leave you. This, of course, is the lot of the true believer, not the individual who claims to be one, but plans, practices, and enjoys their sin. The true believer who has the Holy Spirit hates sin because the desires of the Holy Spirit work in their heart more than their sinful flesh. Now, as you have learned some truths about the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest works in our lives is the work of guidance, comfort, and correction. Through His work, the Holy Spirit keeps us from falling back into the world and keeps us safe until the end. But of course, as we all know, it can be a challenge to be sure we are hearing from Him when He speaks to our hearts. So, here are some signs the Holy Spirit truly is speaking to you. 1. You are being led to exalt Jesus. The Bible clearly tells us how to discern spirits, a very important warning we must follow, especially in these last days where there is so much deception flying all over the place. 1 John 4, 1-3 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. 
Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The devil will never lead you to do anything that exalts Jesus or expands God's kingdom on earth. Everything he leads you to do is Antichrist, anti-God, and anti-kingdom. When a false spirit is presenting itself in your life, your impulse will be to exalt yourself, please yourself, and consider yourself first, even before God. He may even convince you to do this in a religious way by pointing out one or two scriptures to back that action up, but in truth, he is leading you against God. Remember that Satan tried to do that with Jesus? He cited verses from the scriptures for Jesus to bow down before him and to jump from a very high peak. Thank God that Jesus was the truth, and he overcame Satan's temptations. The Holy Spirit will always place Christ before you. Whenever you are seeing and considering God before your actions, thoughts, and decisions, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Listen to Him. 2. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you when you are being drawn to produce His fruit in your life. If you stay long enough with someone, you will start acting, thinking, and talking like them. Similarly, the Holy Spirit is in your heart speaking to you. He gives you instructions that produce His fruit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, and 23 tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This means that even when you are receiving an instruction to show love, to embrace God's joy instead of depression, to control yourself, or to be gentle and kind, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. The beautiful thing about one of these is that they are applicable to every need of your life. Emotional or sensual needs, finances, and businesses. By stirring you up to be faithful, the Holy Spirit will keep you from taking money or office property that isn't yours. By prompting you to practice restraint or self-control, the Holy Spirit is speaking battle between your flesh and God's voice. 3. God's Word comes alive in your heart. Since the devil himself can appear like an angel of light, how can you know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking through someone or just that person's own ideas? How can you know if you are being led astray by Satan rather than following the Holy Spirit as you thought? The answer is in God's Word. In other words, whatever you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you personally about, you should be able to find the same truths, principles, and related ideas in the Bible as well. If you cannot find a direct or related truth in the Bible, or if it outrightly disagrees with it, then you are being led astray by the devil. The Word of God always comes alive when God wants to instruct and guide you with it. You may have read it before, but at the appropriate time, you will notice how it hits differently, seems more precise, and feels very personal. When the Word becomes personal and an answer to what you have been praying about without contradicting who God is and what He commands His children, it's the Spirit speaking to you. Always compare what you are hearing personally to what is already written in the Bible. And if the two match, you can be sure this truly is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. But if not, prayerfully run away from such guidance. It would lead to destruction. 4. You receive an inner peace associated with the instruction aligning with His Word. Psalm 85.8 says, I will listen to what the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. But let them not turn to folly. The things about following the guidance of the Spirit is that, even in the face of chaos, despite feelings of fear and anxiety, you'll have a deep sense of peace, like this is the right thing to do. It would be like having discovered a new idea that would change the world, and being asked to share that with a board of people who want to support you. You know this is the right thing to do, and even if you panic, 
knowing that as long as you attend the meeting and speak, you have the support already. You aren't even trying to win their support. You have it. Your fear is not the outcome, just the tension of standing in front of those people. Notice what Jesus said in John 14, 26 through 27, about the Holy Spirit giving us wisdom and giving us peace. He says, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Hence, when you are receiving an insight that aligns with God's word and despite external chaos, Despite external chaos, you have a deeper sense of peace. That is a sign that what you have received is coming from the Holy Spirit. It will end well. What happens when God sends angels to protect His chosen people? Dear child of God, this is a message of hope for you. God's chosen son or daughter, you are not alone. Even when you feel like it, you are not. God's angels are always watching over you. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 34, verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Things may not seem like it right now. It doesn't change that you are his child, and his angels will watch over you. How do I know this for sure? Among many reasons, one is that you are alive. The fact that you are alive and able to hear my voice means that God is preserving you for something worse that you are not even aware of. Some years ago, I heard the story of a man who never complained but thanked God for everything, good, bad, and ugly. People would wonder why he was always thanking God. His most used words when things went wrong would be, thank God for everything. Let us praise God because although it is not what we expected, it could have been worse. He always had a way to express gratitude in the direst times. This began to annoy some people around him who didn't like that they never saw this man having a bad day or complaining about anything. They devised a means to push him to a point where he'd have no choice but to complain or at least be sad. They decided to attack his son who lived far away. They had heard his father brag about him doing well where he was and how he was visiting on a particular day. So they set a trap for him to end his life hoping that this would break his father down and at least they'd see him sad and weakened. On the day the son returned home, the father gathered family and friends to welcome him. There was a lot of food and drinks and everyone was having a good time. They waited and waited, but the son didn't show up. The night came and everyone began to worry except of course the father. The following day when everyone had concluded that something unfortunate had happened to the son and they were planning to send out a search party hoping to find the son they believed got lost on his journey back home, the son walked into the house. Everyone was surprised because he looked pretty dirty and rough. When he had freshened up, everyone gathered to hear him say what happened. The son said that on his way home, he saw a huge tree falling across the major road leading into the village. The only way to pass was to cut down the tree or travel around it on a rougher terrain, which would involve exiting his vehicle and carrying his belongings through wild thickets. This explained why his clothes looked dirty and ragged. The son did not know that right after where the tree had fallen was a bunch of robbers hired by people who wanted to see his father cry. They had told the robbers to rob and murder him, but the robbers were surprised when the target didn't appear. As the boy shared his story, not knowing what happened, his father, as usual, stood up amid the gathering and said, Glory be to God. Thank God the situation wasn't more serious than this. And my son is home with me now. This is one thing that happens when God sends his angels to protect his chosen people. He will bypass the enemy lines and do something in your life that will deliver you from their snare. Looking at this story, you see that the son's journey was quite challenging and uncomfortable for both him and those waiting for him back home. The thing is that when God sends his angels to protect you, it may not be comfortable. You may lose something, get something you didn't bargain for, or be in a difficult position. At the time, it may look like you have lost, failed, or been beaten. However, this is the angel of the Lord protecting you from an even greater danger that could destroy you. 
Doesn't this story sound like Daniel's story in the Bible? Despite being a captive in a foreign nation, the Bible tells us that Daniel was prosperous. God was with him and gave him a spirit of excellence that made him surpass his contemporaries. But that soon became a problem. These guys were mostly natives of the land and worshiped the local idols. But here was a man, a stranger, a captive, being promoted over them. It triggered envy, and they began to seek his downfall and complete destruction. Beloved, the world can be a cruel place, and without the help of the Lord and the protection of his angels, you may suffer in the hands of the wicked. Daniel found himself in such a predicament. These men convinced the king to pass a law that would implicate Daniel. It would force him to choose between his loyalty to the king and his God. Of course, Daniel chose God, and he was cast into the den of lions to be eaten. However, here is how the story ended. Daniel chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. This, my friend, happens when God sends his angels to protect his chosen ones. Not only will they thwart the enemy's plans against you, as we saw in the story earlier, but they will also render the elements of the enemy's attack powerless over you. In Job chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, He frustrates the devices and schemes of the crafty so that their hands cannot attain success or achieve anything of lasting worth. Take note of the two points in this verse. One, he frustrates, or as some other translations put it, he thwarts the devices of the crafty. Two, he ensures their hands are so powerless that they cannot succeed or achieve anything worthwhile. Daniel's story is a combination of these two points. Not only did God turn the tides against Daniel's foes, but he also made sure that the lions could not hurt him. Beloved, God didn't say the lions would not roar, nor did he say the enemy would not attack you. But he promises that even when the lions roar and the enemy strikes, their blows will not have a lasting effect on you or annihilate you entirely. Why? Because you are God's chosen. Beloved, many things happen when God sends his angels to protect his chosen people. They can attack your attackers directly and bring them down for you, or they can turn them from pursuing you and leave you alone. I have witnessed people walk through the midst of a mob who came to hurt them without a single scratch. I have seen people hide in plain sight, and their pursuers came to the spot and searched but couldn't see them. Remember that the Bible says that this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness, their justification is Him. Isaiah 54 verse 17 No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Maybe you are asking, so how do I enjoy angelic protection more in my life? Would you like to know how this works? Let me share three practical factors that can cause God to send his angels to protect you. Become part of God's chosen people. There are only two people in the Bible that we know as God's chosen people. First, the Israelites, descendants of Abraham, and second, everyone who is born again through faith in Jesus Christ. Everyone who receives God's saving grace becomes part of God's chosen people. So, if you want to enjoy the angelic protection that children of God have, then the first thing is that you must become a part of God's family. And how do you become a member of God's family? Surrender your life to Jesus through faith in his redemptive work on the cross. You come into God's family when Jesus becomes Lord and Savior over your life. You can enjoy the blessings of the kingdom. Walk in obedience and reverence for God. 
Proverbs 16, 7 says, When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, He causes their enemies to make peace with them. Another portion of Scripture tells us that God's angels are constantly standing guard around people who fear and live their lives in obedience to God. It is one thing to claim to be a member of God's family and another thing to surrender your choices, life, character, and pride to Him. When you place God first in your life and resolve to live only according to those things that please Him by obeying what is in the Bible, then be sure that, like Daniel, you will receive angelic protection over your life. Love the Lord and seek Him. Whoever loves God will enjoy angelic protection in their lives. According to Psalm 91, when you make God your dwelling place, make Him the foundation of your trust and commit yourself to love Him from your heart. He assures you that no evil will come near your house. Showing love to others and serving God with the gifts He has given you are both evidence of your passion and desire for God. If you love the Lord and live for Him, then you don't need to fear. His angels will protect you. Don't worry about the threats in front of you. The ones with you are greater than the ones in front of you. Did you know that every night you sleep, you have one or two hours of dreams? After five minutes, half of what you dreamt is forgotten. Researchers have shown that dreaming is beneficial to your health and well-being. It even aids in the reduction of stress. Dreams can also help you re-energize your mind and body. That was certainly the case with Joseph. Joseph's dreams, according to Genesis 37, recharged his intellect and rejuvenated his body. Instead of forgetting his dreams, he pursued them and believed in them. Have you ever had a dream? Perhaps you once had a dream, but instead of following it, you forgot about it and abandoned it. Don't give up today, I'm telling you. Don't give up on your dream. Every generation of Christians has been captivated by Joseph's narrative because it presents such a dramatic depiction of issues that we can all relate to. He is sold as a slave and hauled off to a strange place when he's only 17 years old. He begins to do well all of a sudden. Then he has a falling out with his employer after his boss's wife accuses him of attempting to rape her. He has been sentenced to years in jail. He has to live with dreams that are reawakened and then destroyed once again. It's difficult to see Joseph nurturing his goals over 13 years of growing struggle and sorrow. Then seemingly out of nowhere, he ascends to power in Egypt, forcing his brothers to crawl to him for assistance. It's a fantastic narrative full of raw passion and deception, political scheming and sibling rivalry, love and hatred, jealousy, lust, ambition, courage, and cowardice, judgment and grace. In some ways, Joseph is the hero, but the actual star is God. As we witness God's drama develop through the twists and turns of Joseph's journey, from Joseph's perspective, what appears to be devastating reversals are actually chances for God to further his goals. As a result, we're encouraged to explore and interpret our own dreams in light of these revelations. We are encouraged not to give up on our dreams despite anything just like Joseph did. Could it be that the same God is working out His sovereign intentions even in the tangles of our imaginations and in the intimate relationships we have? When everyone is given up on your dream, you included, God will stay faithful and see that it's fulfilled. He is amazing and He loves you that much. How do we react when things don't turn out the way we plan? When it appears that our dreams aren't coming true, do we continue to cling to them? Many Christians have thrown a massive, God, you don't care about me. I'm better than this. I don't want this. I'm not intended to be here. You don't love me, guilt trip or shouting match. We don't really know if Joseph had one, but we do know that he didn't stay there and we should neither. The Lord is so concerned about us that He does not abandon us where we are. He desires for us to evolve into mature children, capable of sharing in His holiness. He wants us to reap a crop of righteousness. He will answer each of your prayers and make your dreams come true. Don't give up. He cares. He loves you. You are His.
While we're in the thick of our life stories, we must understand this. We frequently want to rush to the finish line, but God is more concerned with the journey. He wants our loyalty, but we want the purpose and power for ourselves. He is more concerned with our character than our position, with our heart rather than our situations, and with our relationship with Him than with everything else. The importance of our relationship with God cannot be overstated. Know that God is with you on your path, from dream to fulfillment, no matter where you are, no matter who you are. Please don't give up. Know that He is good, even on the bad days. Allowing circumstances to define your viewpoint is not a good idea. Even if you don't believe you can, don't lose hope because God is on your side. As Paul encouraged in Philippians 3, 12-14, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Have you prayed to the Lord about your dreams and plans? It's important to remember that God has the last say. Tell Him about your intentions, explain why they're important to you, and beg that your aspirations do not conflict with His will. How many times have we made plans and goals just to have them revised in the middle of the process? Yet, as we consider the conclusion, we frequently realize that it was only God's mercy that we were led in a different way, to a more fruitful result. A man's mind may plot his course, but the Lord, in His kindness, directs our feet. Many schemes may be hidden in a man's heart, but our merciful God leads us in the right direction. For the Lord's wisdom endures forever. Proverbs 16, 1 says, the plan of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. It is only through mercy and grace that you have a will to make decisions, a mind to consider options, and a heart to develop plans. However, once you have done everything you're capable of, it is by God's favor that the Lord formulates the end conclusion. For while dreams and plans belong to you, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. This verse emphasizes the significance for every child of God to utilize his or her God-given free will to make intelligent choices as we endeavor to carry out God's perfect will in our decisions. He will grant you your heart's wants, for when we direct your heart to your heavenly Savior, His perfect desire becomes the perfect plans of our inner being. Everyone has life goals and dreams, some of which we can achieve on our own and others that require a little more assistance. I'm sure that you have dreams to acquire that job, get married, go to college, buying a house, go overseas and so on. No matter how large or tiny your dream is, never give up on it. There are some things we want that only God can provide. When things don't go our way and we appeal to God for assistance, but He doesn't appear to hear us, we become disheartened. We think He isn't there for us or doesn't want to assist us, but this isn't the case. He hears you and is aware of your heart's wishes. When you're ready, He knows when, He'll give you everything you want. Psalm 37, 4 through 6 says, Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. When we desire anything in life, it tends to absorb our thoughts. We begin to excessively think about the things we most desire, and it begins to consume a significant amount of our time, energy, and thinking. Convert your obsessive thinking to a prayer. Give it to God and trust Him to handle it. Stop fretting and attempting to accomplish everything on your own. Instead, seek God's assistance. 
When your dreams take a long time to come true, we get fearful. The first step is to transform your fear into trust. Give God your dreams in prayer and trust that He will help you turn the situation around because He's the only one who can move mountains and help you achieve everything your heart wants. Jesus often reminded us that our loving God is our Father. In the same manner that we have earthly parents, God is our Father and we are His responsibility. Never forget that you are God's child. He adores and cherishes you. A physical parent may forsake you, but God will never abandon you ever. Whatever it is that you desire, whatever it is that you beg Him for, He hears you. He will give you exactly what you asked for and more. Don't give up if He doesn't appear to be responding. Everything will happen according to His plan. God knows what is best for you and hears your heart's wishes. When the moment is right, He will grant your heart's wishes. Patience and faith in the Lord are essential. Watch Him while He fulfills all of your wishes. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? You are God's child, and you must trust your heavenly Father to give you good things. Just as a child trusts his parents to give him candy and stuff. Rather than giving up on your dreams or plans, speak with Him first and ask Him to help you make them a reality. The Lord Jesus encouraged us to ask God for the things we need and to keep asking. For whoever asks receives, Matthew 7, 7. Because He is a wonderful and gracious Father who has promised to supply all we require. Do not listen to the devil's lies, but rather demonstrate your trust in Him and stand firm on the word of truth by asking God for what you require and expecting Him to provide because He will.